Can you hear me? Yes. Terrific. I'm going to wait one minute and then we're going to get started. Just want to make sure people who are trying to log on using Zoom are able to go through the whole process. It's pretty funny. Get started. All right, hello everybody. Um, welcome to this first in hopefully a long series of Wednesdays with Linda here at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. I'm Linda Shore, I'm the Executive Director of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and um, I'm thrilled to do these police seminars with everybody. Um, I do wanna say um, it's a little bit about me. Um, I've been the Executive Director for almost three years now and prior to that, I um, taught at the Exploratorium in San Francisco. I was a staff scientist there and the director of the Teacher Institute. So some of the things we're going to be doing um, represent some of the knowledge I've gained in my 20 so years of um, doing museum outreach um, and particularly today. Um, the topic for today is uh, hands-on activities for large lectures. Are you kidding me? Um, Lots of times I found myself teaching astronomy to 200, 300, 600, up to 1,000 people in an audience. And um, the challenge was, could I engage everybody in the audience in some sort of a hands-on activity? And the answer is yes, you can. So I'm going to be showing you just a couple of ideas today. And uh, so let me show you what I have here. This is not something, oops. You have logged in from another device. Oh, <laughs> I think we have an ASP member who's here, which is nice. All right. Um, what we're going to be doing today is looking at scale models. Um, it's something that I think if you're doing outreach is incredibly important to do. You may be bored to tears with it, but the truth of the matter is that an understanding of the size and scale of the objects in the universe is really essential to understanding astronomy. If you have misconceptions about size, distance, scale, um, you'll see when we do this activity today that it can lead to a lot of other problems. So we'll be using this in a moment. Um, I'm going to be putting on a PowerPoint presentation, and if you can't see it, if you can um, send a chat, secret chat message to Eva, who you can see right there, <laughs> she can help you with that. So let me um, take a moment to share my screen with you. And hopefully, you can see this PowerPoint. And if you can't see a PowerPoint on your screen right now, let please let Eva know and she'll help you hopefully. And if she can't help you, you can just listen to my voice. Um, so like I said, today's activity or today's um, discussion is gonna be on hands-on astronomy with large crowds, are you kidding me? So to get started, um, let's, think about what some of the barriers might be. So why don't you send a chat message on to Eva saying, you know, if you've been prevented from doing this before, like here's this poor man at a school assembly um, trying to do something. If you were tasked with doing a hands-on activity with this crowd, what are some challenges? So go ahead and let Eva know. 
and Eva will be letting me know she's actually right across from me in, in this office. <laughs> Arrangement of room. The arrangement of the room, really good. Um, oftentimes it'll be an amphitheater. I've had situations where I've been outdoors with a megaphone um, and people are sort of everywhere. Other times um, I've been in a school assembly situation exactly like that with a thousand kids. So it's difficult um, to get them grouped together at tables doing an activity. So that can be a challenge. Any other ideas? out there in digital land. Well, I'll give you a few that um, occurred to me when I was starting this, and materials management. Am I going to be passing out a thousand scissors, a thousand marbles, a thousand, and how am I going to do that? Challenges and Here we are. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Can everybody hear me okay? You can nod. Okay, sorry, we're having internet conductivity problems. I, I may go in and out, so I'll try to hurry. <laughs> so let me share my, is my screen still shared with everybody? Okay. So moving ahead. So most challenges do involve materials management. Um, so one way to handle materials management so that you yourself aren't bringing a hundred or a thousand objects with you is to try to think of materials that the audience already has with them. And that, I have to put my PowerPoint back on. Oops. I have to put my PowerPoint back on. There we go. There we go. Sorry. All right. So today we're going to look at something that every audience has with them, which is coins. And I've done this internationally as well. So this works no matter what country you're in, everybody's got coins. You just have to take a look at them um, to see what size they're going to be. So let's think of this. If the earth were the size of a tennis ball, if the earth were the size of a tennis ball, which of the following coins would best represent the moon to scale. So if you're in another country, their coins are gonna be a little different. You may have to find a different kind of ball. But here are your choices. We're in the US, so it's the American quarter, the nickel, or the penny. All right, so let me just give you a clue. And I know we've got really experienced astronomy educators here, so you guys know the answer, but Marnie said the penny. Marnie said the penny. Very good. So before we answer that, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen for a moment and go back to this globe and tennis ball I had earlier. Now, the tennis ball is representing the earth and the question I just asked, but let's ignore that for a second. Lots of times, if you have a globe like this and a tennis ball like this, this is what the vast majority of people in your audience think the correct size and of the Earth compared to the moon is. And if you say, what, is, what do you think? Earth, moon, does this feel about right? Everybody will pick this. If you hold up a globe like this and a tennis ball like this, and maybe you bring with 
bring along a golf ball and a, a marble, this is going to be the answer. Why? Because this is what most people see in textbooks. This is the model people use. They're often very surprised at what the actual size is. So coins are great. So I happen to have a bag of coins right here and I will just spill them out for you. So what you do is you tell people, reach in your pockets, dump all your coins in your lap, and you may need to use your neighbors for this. Happy to be a guinea pig, Eva. <laughs> so here are my coins. Okay, here they are. I've got, I think some of you got the message that we wanted you to bring pennies and nickels and quarters and things like that with you. I brought a tennis ball. So if you have a lot of people in your audience, let's say I'm, I've done this actually with a thousand people. Do I need a thousand tennis balls? Um, this happens to be my dogs. I happen to have a thousand tennis balls. But if you don't, then just a few is fine. Then you can just pass them around the room. Like if you have a thousand people, I'd probably want to bring about 50. <laughs> so the question is which of these coins will work best for the moon. Anybody know what the moon, Earth's diameter is in miles, let's just say, in miles? Let's see, do we have any answers? 8,000, 8, that is correct. And how about the moon? What's the diameter of the moon? You guys are a great audience. 2,000. 2,000. 2,000. So if the moon is, has a diameter of 2,000 and this has a diameter of 8,000, then we're looking for something that's a quarter the diameter or four coins laid end to end like this. Let's see, we're not using dimes because they're so close to pennies and I'm gonna get rid of these dimes, use them another time. Here's the nickels. Here are the quarters, oops, quarters. Gonna line them up really nice for you. So we need four of them end to end to be the diameter of this ball. Let's see if I can get this so you can see it. It's a little tricky, we're at an angle here. But do you see how, no, do you see how the pennies are the closest to four to one ratio? So now, this is the correct answer. And this is surprising to people. They don't expect the moon to be so small compared to the Earth. So that's generally the first surprise. Again, this didn't require much for you to pass out other than tennis balls for people because the coins they brought. Okay, now for the really tougher question. How far apart are these in space? How far apart are they in space? Okay, so far apart, farther than my screen. Okay, so 30 Earth diameters. Chances are extremely good that your audience will think it's about like this. Because again, this is what they've seen in books, that the, that the moon is only a handful of Earth's, Earth diameters away or Earth's laid end to end. But the distance, of course, between the two is 240,000 miles, 240,000 miles, 240,000 divided by 8,000, 240,000 divided by 8, 30, 30 tennis balls laid end to end. And this is why I will always bring, if I can, for a really large crowd, 30 tennis balls with me. Because I ask everybody, could you pass those tennis balls back? And they, I usually get them thrown back at me. And I lay them down on the floor so that everybody can see. If you really have a giant crowd and you don't want to bring 100 balls, then you can say, well, can you lay out, oh, say 10 on the floor? Can you, so just bring 10 tennis balls with you and then multiply that by three, and then that will give you the answer too. Well, you can see I can't even do this with my arms, right? Way bigger in distance than most people expect, okay? What else can you do? I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint presentation. Share screen.
Okay, so the question I asked was which one? And it was in fact the penny. Earth's diameter is 8,000 miles, just as review. Moon's 2,000, four to one ratio. Here's our choices. And you can see, you know, when you just hold them in your hand like this, or when you just hold the dime nickel in a quarter in your hand, they don't seem all that different in size. But when you lay them out end to end, you really do see the difference. And here's my tennis ball superimposed. So you can see the closest match really is the penny. And by the way, this PowerPoint is to scale. And what about the distance? And here it is, 240,000 miles divided by 8,000 would give me 30 Earths laid end to end, okay? So why bother doing this? Why is this so important? And I always do this activity as often as I can with people. For example, when you ask people what causes the phases of the moon, if your conception is that the Earth and moon are just a couple of Earth diameters away, I don't know if people can, I don't know if you can also see me on the TV. Am I in the corner? Oh, good. Excellent. If this is your conception, right, then it would be nearly impossible. In fact, it would be impossible to be in the, to be out of the Earth's shadow once a month, right? So if the sun is over here, right, how could you possibly avoid being in the Earth's shadow. So when you ask people what causes the phases of the moon, they say, oh, well, we're in the Earth's shadow once a month. But if you show the correct size distance and show the five degree tip, the inclination of the Earth and moon, you can see that being in the Earth's shadow doesn't happen that often. That's an eclipse. And when you're not in it, it's a full moon. So it's much easier to conceptualize this. There are other problems that creep up as well, but this is an important one. Here's another, oops. Oh, I wanna show you this little movie. This is a, um, I don't know much about this fellow. If you do, please let me know. But he has a whole YouTube channel that's very engaging and, and he deals with misconceptions in science. And in this particular video, which I really hope you'll be able to hear, um, and let me know if you can't, we're going to be, um, He's asking people on the street or on his campus about the size, the relative size and distance of the Earth and Moon. So here we go. Actually, I think he's just asking about the, the, the distance. This is uh, okay. And this Are you hearing it? Yes. Now, uh, our first uh, challenge is how far apart. Uh, on the Earth. Okay. Oh, I guess maybe about that far, maybe? How about that much? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Roughly? Like that? Right like that? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this part? It's like here. Yeah. Rough. Right there? Yeah. All right, all right. Let's, let's, uh... Okay. Can I... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. See what the answer says here. Okay. These are some images I found on a Google image search for the Earth and the Moon. Diagrams that are not to scale are pretty common, and I understand why we make them, so you can show the detail without showing all that uninteresting space in between. But they can have a problematic effect on learning because they give people the wrong idea about the relative proximities of things. Now, if we want to talk about the distance between the Earth and the Moon, it's actually It's about here. Think about this. It takes light one second to go from the Earth to the Moon. It takes eight minutes for light to travel to the Sun, and four years to go to our nearest star. Then consider that there are a hundred billion stars in our galaxy, and as far as we know, a hundred billion galaxies in the universe. So the universe truly is bigger than we can imagine, and certainly bigger than we can draw to scale. All right. Well, I, I love this guy. Um, and if you go to this, this YouTube link that I'm circling down here, on the side, you'll see a lot of other videos that he's made. Um, some of them are astronomy, but many of them are things like um, 
where does a tree get all the energy it needs to go from a seed to a tree? Where, where'd that mass come from? That, those type of questions that are pretty, pretty classic misconceptions type questions. Um, so here's another. If we use that same model of this being the earth and this little guy being the moon, then what's the sun? How large is the sun at this scale? And again, this is really important because if you ask a lot of adults, um, I did research years and years ago when I was um, at Harvard doing um, Project Star in a private universe. I was part of that project. We asked people what they thought the stars were. And it was surprising the percentage of people who thought they were just tiny little dots of light scattered between us and Pluto. But yet they knew that there were these things called suns that were gigantic and produced all this energy. There was really a mismatch between understanding what these little points of light were and what a sun was. And if you ask how large the sun was at this scale, you'd get something about the size of this tennis ball or maybe twice the size. Or if you were really lucky, maybe five times the size. But what is it? Morning! <laughs> <laughs> yes. So let's take a look at that. So if you're, again, remember that your crowd has coins with them and they now have a moon, which is a penny. So the diameter is roughly speaking 800,000 miles across, 860,000 miles across. If your tennis ball is 8,000 miles across, Marnie, yes, 100 Earths laid end to end, 100 Earths laid end to end. If you have a really big crowd, you can do it with the pennies. Remember, this was a hundred, this was a quarter the size. How many pennies? And 400 pennies. How much? How much is that? Four dollars. So for four little dollars, <laughs> you can go to your bank and get lots of rolls of pennies and spread them out on the floor and have the crowd help you. It's worth it. It takes a while, but it keeps them busy. And you can lay the 400 out end to end and you can say, that's the size of the sun. It's completely worth it because it's shocking. It really is quite shocking. Too bad it costs so much more than to get there. Too bad it, too bad doing the activity costs more than to get, oh, too bad, <laughs> say that again. <laughs> more than $4. Yes, it does take a lot more than $4 to get there. That's true. So 100 of t the tennis balls, $4 worth of pennies. Ironically, <laughs> cheaper than this probably. All right. Just showing you a couple of other slides, which you're welcome, by the way, to use if you ever do this presentation. Um, here's a uh, scale model showing the size of the sun and the other planets, including Pluto. And you can see the Earth is just labeled as this tiny, tiny little, tiny little speck of a thing. Imagine a hundred of those laid end to end. Jupiter's much larger, only 10 Jupiters laid end to end, right? Only 10 or 40 cents, 40 cents, we'll get you, we'll get you Jupiter. Here's another schematic for you. On the top, on the top left, there's the sun and Jupiter and Earth to scale. On the top right, you can see that 10 Jupiters laid to end to end gives you the size of the sun, 10 Jupiters, or 10 Jupiters across in the lower left, 10, 10, Jupiter, 10 Earths lined up gives you one Jupiter. So when you multiply the two together, you get 100 Earths laid end to end. So this is just um, a way to remind yourself of what the relative size and scale of the planets and Earth and the Sun are. Another way to do it, yet another way with coins. We already did the distance earlier and that tiny little thing, this is a vision test for you folks. You can probably see a tiny little green dot. That's your tennis ball. And if you look over to your 
right, you see an even tinier dot, that's your, that's your penny. If you lay that distance, remember the distance between the Earth and Moon? And if you lay that down three times, it's going to be a little small, but it's almost the size of the sun. It's actually three and a half of those distances. So there's a number of ways you can, you can show people this. Okay, remember that little tiny thing is a tennis ball, and that's how much 400 of your pennies is going to be laid end to end. I totally think you should do it. You should do it by yourself. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. Now the last one. What's the scale distance between the Earth and Sun? Now I'm going to warn you, it's really much larger than most people think. And it probably is not going to fit in any amphitheater that you're working in if this is the size of your of your earth and this is the size of your moon and 400 pennies late end to end is the size of your sun ain't gonna fit in any amphitheater okay in fact ready to have your mind blown you guys already know this if you take that big giant sun that you just made that's 400 pennies lined up you need to line those up 100 times, and that will get you the distance between this and that big giant sun you made with 400 pennies. I know. That's hard to visualize. So we have another way to help people visualize it, and it involves – some of you know this activity because you're devotees of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific's universe at your fingertips. But here's some register tape that you can get pretty much at any office supply store. This is a relatively large roll, but this is an, if you bring this roll with you, this is enough pretty much for a group of 100 or more people, probably 200 people. It doesn't take much. And with this register tape, you can do a make and take. And all people have to do, all you have to do is give them a piece of register tape that's roughly arm's length. That's it. And if you pass the register tape around, they can do this themselves. You don't have to do the ripping. They can do that. And you can even have them do that while you're doing this other act, all the other activities I talked about. Just, just tell them, oh, by the way, when the register tape gets to you, you want to rip off a piece of tape that is about at arm's length. And then using this, using this, they can make a scale model of the solar system, but this isn't going to be the Earth anymore. So I'm going to let our own uh, Vivian show you this. This, Viv this is Vivian White um, showing you how to do pocket solar system to scale using register tape. So here we go. People often think that orbits of the planets are more or less evenly spaced and closer together than in reality. Building scale models of the solar system is a challenge because of the distances and huge size differences involved. This is a simple little model to give you an easy way to demonstrate to a number, any number of people an overview of the approximate distances between the orbits of the planets and other regions of our solar system. First, everyone watching this must participate. Have each person pull off a strip of register tape about the length of the person's body. That's about fingertip to fingertip. Cut or fold over the ends so that they're straight. Marty suggested to move your mic. You'll want to label one end Pluto slash hyperbelt. the sun and the average distance of
My apologies. I'm going to go back a little. And open it up again. Make a mark of that crease. Let's think about the planets of the solar system. Which planet do you suppose is halfway between the sun and the average of Pluto's orbit? Let me give you a hint. You need to be careful about using this hint. It depends a bit on your audience. If you hold the sun at your head and Pluto at your feet, which body part is halfway in the middle? Right. Very good. Bet you'll never forget which planet it is. Now fold the tape back in half. And then fold it in half again. Make a crease there. Now unfold it. You have the solar system divided into quarters, with the sun at one end, Pluto's orbit on the other, and Uranus's orbit in the middle. Hold the Pluto end and label the fold closest to Pluto as Neptune. Label the other fold closest to the sun as okay. Everyone guess. Right, Saturn. Here's an easy way to remember the order of these three outer planets. We know there's a sun at the center of the solar system, but there's also a sun, an S-U-N, in the outer planets, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, S-U-N. Okay, you've mapped out three quarters of the solar system and you still don't have all the gas giants. So we have to fit everything else in that last quarter between the sun and Saturn. Let's keep going to see how this will work. Fold the sun to Saturn's orbit. Increase it. What's the next planet in? Right, Jupiter. Fold the sun out to meet Jupiter's orbit. Now this is a little tricky. Which structure did we say is just inside Jupiter's orbit? The asteroid belt. At this point, things start getting a little crowded and folding is tough to get precise distances. Fold the sun to the asteroid belt, increase it. Next planet in. Right, Mars, label that. How many more planet orbits do we need to place? Yes, three more orbits. Now fold the sun to the orbit of Mars and leave it folded. Fold that section again, fold that section in half again. Unfold the tape and you should have three creases. Mark Earth on the crease nearest Mars, then Venus, then Mercury closest to the Sun. Earth, Venus, Mercury. Have your visitors stretch out the model and take a good look at what they've made. Many people are unaware of how empty the outer solar system really is. There's a reason they call it space. And how close, relatively speaking, the orbits of the inner solar system are. Now all your visitors need to do is roll it up and put it in their pocket. And that was our own Vivian White. Thank you, Vivian. So again, really simple. Everybody can do it in their seats. It really only requires them to make folds. And if they have a pen or pencil with them, even better. So then they'll have a scale model not of the individual objects, but of their distance apart, okay? Well, what else can you do with coins? Is that it, just scale models? 
well, no, there's lots of other things you can do with coins. And I'm going to show you one of my favorites. One of um, the things that I've done in my past is I've worked with Tibetan monks in exile in India. And what you're looking at are those monks and nuns and Chris Impey, who's a fabulous astronomy educator and um, scientist at the, at, in Arizona. What he does, he uses poker chips, but he also sometimes uses coins, is he'll just strew the coins out on the floor. And he'll ask people to think about these coins as just particles in space, mass. And these masses are all gravitationally attracted to one another. The closer two objects are to each other, the more gravitational attraction they have, and the larger they are, the more gravitational attraction they have. But the more important factor is, of course, distance, because, and here's the math part, gravity is related to one over the distance between objects squared. So it, as important as mass is, distance is more important. And this is where it becomes really important to be a Tibetan monk and to have enormous patience and live in the now. What he has these monks do is get on the floor and look for coins that take a coin, one coin, take a look, look around that coin and see where the closest coin is and move slightly toward that. Now you can be even more complicated and you can imagine all the coins around pulling on this one coin and then make a decision. Well, this one is closer, this one's a little farther away. So let's see, there's a little more force toward the closer one. So I'm gonna move in between the two. I mean, you can be pretty nuanced about this if you want. Or if it's just to get the basic idea, you can just say, move a little toward the nearest coin. Once you've moved it, you have to turn it over so that they're all heads up to start with and then you turn it over and it's a tails. Then you find another one that's heads. Do the same thing, turn it over, turn it over until they're all turned over. A big crowd helps, a big patient crowd. Once that's done, you repeat the process. And as coins get closer and closer together, when they touch, you stack them on each other to represent greater mass. Now they have greater gravitational attraction. And you keep doing that until you discover that this random pattern of coins will eventually become clumpy. And that's a great model for the early universe. It explains the voids between the galactic clusters in the early universe. And you can also use it to model planet for star formation in a star formation region, any place where you have a random set of particles gravitationally attracted. So what I'm going to show you now is a film of the monks actually doing this activity. Um, it takes a very long time to do this activity. You have to be patient. So fortunately, when Chris filmed it, he did it in um, high speed so that you don't have to wait so long to see the final results. So Ready? Here we go. There's no sound on this, so don't worry if you don't hear anything. Marty says you can also do it with people as particles in a large area. So here the monks go on their first go around. And you can see the clumpiness form. And now Chris is telling them, okay, we need to do it again. And this time you need to do it for the clumps. And you can see monks do have cell phones. They're taking pictures of this. And so... They, they stack them on top of one another when they get really close. And you can see how clumpy this got. And these poker chips, <laughs> and then they all smash them together. Um, so these were poker chips. And it's easier to turn them over to, to see that you've already finished one of the, one of the motions. Um, it's a little harder when you do heads and tail coins. But the big crunch. The big crunch. That was the big crunch. Yes, they all smash them together. Um, I love working with the monks. They have phenomenal patience. and and they love doing any activity you give them. Um, so that's something else you can do with coins. And as Marnie pointed out, you can all, if you don't have coins, this is a great activity to do without coins. And one of the ways I've seen this done is you have, and this works with huge groups of people, I mean, really big groups of people. So if you're a park ranger, or if you're in, um, doing an astronomy festival, or you're doing a whole school, this works great. So what you do is you randomly separate all these people, and 
you have them hold up the number of letters in their last name. So for me, it's sure, S-H-O-R-E, five letters, I hold up a five. Um, Eva has a very long name. <laughs> How many letters in your name, Eva? Seven. Seven letters in her name. So she would hold up seven. I'm sorry, nine. Nine, she doesn't even know. Nine. <laughs> Nine. That's how many letters she has. She can't even count. If you ha have a super long name, right, then let's say 12 letters. This represents a 10, and this represents a 2. You hold this up in the air, and now, like the coins, you're going to look around at all of your neighbors and try to find somebody who's either close or who has a lot of letters in their name, a lot of mass. Closeness is more important. It's much more important to be close than to have mass. So you kind of have to judge. And this is very dynamic because everybody's going to move at the same time. You're going to go ready, set, go, take a baby step. So you take one baby step in whatever direction you need to go. And sometimes the person who's your neighbor is going to move away from you, but that's okay. That's okay. And then do it again. And so you keep repeating this. And with people, you can also get this clumpiness. You can also get clumpiness. And when two people touch, they've got to combine the letters of their name and what do you do if you're more than two fists you've got more than 20 letters you just stick with 20 you're a pretty big thing <laughs> so even a big group can only get as high as 20 for this so you don't need you don't even need coins so I'm leaving you with some resources um, there are some activities that you can do with paper plates Again, very easy to pack in your suitcase. And if you happen to be doing this at a picnic, the paper plates will already be there. And there's some interesting paper plate astronomy there. Um, Pocket Solar System, you just saw Vivian do that. And that is the link to get you there. Um, Gravity, the Great Galactic Glue, which was the film we just um, looked at, basically done with people. That's Gravity, the Great Galactic Glue. You can look at that. And there's a lot of activities that involve kinesthetics, kinesthetic pedagogy, which just means having people use their bodies and move in order to model something. And next time we meet, next Wednesday in a month, we're going we're gonna to spend the whole time just looking at kinesthetic astronomy and how you can, especially with kids, how you can get kids moving around and, and learning something about space and the stars. So thank you for joining me today. These are all going to be videoed and archived, and you can watch them over and over and over and over again. Or you can send them to your friends or whatever you'd like. Um, certainly, if you have any comments on how we can improve this, like making sure our connection is a little better, <laughs> we'd be happy <laughs> if you'd let us know. And we're also going to make um, future ones a bit more interactive. We had a bit of a small crowd today, but when we have more people, then we can do more interactive activities with everybody. Any questions? No? Eva, any questions from the audience? No, I just want to thank everyone for joining and hope to see you next month. Goodbye from Galactic Headquarters of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. <laughs>